but we're really happy to to have you here and we have a a small but quite diverse uh, group of PhD students with us. Uh, they are at different stages uh, of their career. Um, and we have, because it's the last day, we've looked a lot at what was the impact of Brexit on the UK, high and low politics. But today we're focusing on the impact of Brexit on the EU. So the floor is yours. And um, you, after your presentation, I, I'm sure many of us will have questions for you. Perfect. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to speak to you. And I, I must say, I'm not just going on my holidays this summer, I'm retiring. So after a very long academic career, I'm now going to concentrate on my own work and I'm not going to worry unduly about organizations or programs or research bids. So I, I'm, about to be, uh, I'm about to be liberated. And next September will be the first Monday in September, the first week of September that I don't have to be anywhere uh, after 43 years. So I'm looking forward. Now I'm going to share my screen with you. And if you if you can please move the, the, the screen sharing at the top, then no, it needs to come up so that I get to slideshow. OK, so I will talk a little about the future of the EU after Brexit, but I think it's important to contextualize that in terms of uh, Brexit was a very big event for the EU. It remains a very significant process for the EU, but it will not determine the EU's future. One of the important takeaways from the way in which the EU handled Brexit is that the EU is very attentive now to, its, to defending itself to its own survival. And it has a very clear view uh, about how that happens. So, on the 24th of June 2016, one could have argued that the EU had one more shock that would break the camel's back. It came after the Eurozone migration, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, I will argue the EU has had a good Brexit. So what, what mattered for the EU to become 27? There was the shock, first state in the history of the EU to leave, but the instinctive reaction was that the collect collective EU would ensure that the polity and its systems survive. The EU acted strategically, it designed procedures to manage the process, and it deployed Article 50. And it brought the equivalent of what I would call state capacity to bear. It brought its institutional capacity, its knowledge capacity, and its experience as a negotiation machine. So it was, once it absorbed the shock, it framed Brexit as an exogenous shock, not endogenous, and it worked to uh, order that. So what is the outcome? We have two treaties now between the EU and the UK, the withdrawal agreement, the most contentious part of which is the Northern Ireland Protocol. And then we have the uh, TCA. The TCA is a deal, a tr trade deal plus. It's the most complex trade deal the EU has ever signed, but it has and will continue to create enormous friction in engagement between the UK and the EU. The most important issues in the end for this agreement were the level playing field, the UK did not think it needed that any such level playing field provisions were needed, and the EU was very insistent. So although the UK achieved its aim of not, not necessarily being bound by EU law, in fact, the EU through the LPFs will keep the UK in its regulatory orbit, if not its space. Fisheries was the other very contentious issue that almost broke the negotiations, but the EU has linked fish to energy. So if the EU does not, in, if the UK does not behave on fish, then uh, the EU will take it out of the energy union, which is very significant for the UK. And then as we see almost daily, the governance is very problematic. This was the only deal possible because the deal was the outcome 
of a clash of um, of a clash of models and a clash of red lines. And it's not a stable equilibrium and it's not a good equilibrium, but it was all that was possible. So what do we, it, how do we contextualize Brexit in, the re, in relation to everything else the EU is doing? Well, firstly, the EU in the last 10, now over 10 years has moved from a politics of regulation, which remains very important to it, to a politics of crisis and events. And it has become a more resilient institution in that period. But although it's now, it faces the pandemic, it also is looking very clearly at major strategic future direction. And that's the Green Deal, digital, political economy and welfare and Europe's role in the world. Internally in the EU, the most challenging issue uh, is the rule of law crisis. The fact that there uh, there are a number of East Central European countries that no longer respect freedom of the press or freedom of the judiciary. And that's almost like an inner cancer that the EU really struggles with. Then the pandemic. Uh, it is very instructive to look at the EU's response to the pandemic and contrast it with the Eurozone crisis. The, the, the response was so much faster this time round. The EU began with its existing toolkit of policies and instruments, but then there was a demand for a transformative instrument, a transformative uh, policy. And through from April 2020 to July 2020, there was a agree an agreement emerged on creating what is now the RRF, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, but was originally labeled as a recovery fund. This really is a step change and a breakthrough. It's a step change because it firstly I was a major shift by, uh, by Berlin in terms of its preferences. Uh, Germ Germany, albeit temporarily, agreed to the common issuance of debt. And that's, in my view, a game changer. But of course, the negotiations to get to the end to get an outcome of the RRF and the MFF, the budgetary regime of the EU, there were two big cleavages. There was the cleavage between those countries that wanted an RRF, including common debt and grants, and the frugals that didn't. And the frugals were the small North European, uh, North European countries led by the Dutch. The Dutch, the Danes, the Swedes, and uh, on occasion, uh, the, the, the Finns, they lost. They lost decisively in that the principle of common debt and grants was, was established, but they did, it, it, they got side payments in terms of rebates from the EU budget, and they were in a sense bought off. But then the second cleavage was, how do you justify giving very significant amounts of European taxpayers' money to the authoritarians in the East. And this is where the Dutch again led, uh, where they were very insistent on additional conditionalities in the EU, uh, in the EU uh, treaty, the use of conditionality in relation to the RRF and the budget. Here, there was a standoff and uh, led by Orban, Hungary and Poland said they would veto the entire agreement and they threatened to do so in autumn 2020. And that's when the rest of the EU began to say, well, we can go resort to enhanced cooperation. We can go back. So in the end, there is an outcome. And you, there now will be the common borrowing by the EU and the flow to the member states. So let me to give you a conceptual framework of potential scenarios for the future of the EU. So one is the classical disintegration, there will be less EU. Second, muddling through, which is status quo plus. But on the below the bar, there are two models that potentially lead to a more centralized EU with more capacity. One I would classify as functional functional federalism, which means more EU, but in specific areas. And then the other is that Macron concept of strategic autonomy, European sovereignty, where the EU moves to create more centralized capacity. Now, in terms of the intervening variables that will determine 
what happens, I would say you need to look to two. One, the global system, at great power competition, what happens in the EU neighborhood in Africa, and what happens in terms of hard geopolitics and interdependence in the next phase, and then domestic politics, the nature of the cleavages and the intersection between domestic and EU politics. So for me, the three big questions for the EU as it faces into the remainder of the third decade of the 21st century are how it generates sufficient capacity to act, how it ensures the member states buy into the collective, and how it ensures that the EU remains legitimate and enhances its legitimacy over the next 10 to 20 years. Because what is required for the transformative agenda that the EU has embarked on, Green Deal, digital, et cetera, et cetera, is a level of collective mobilization akin to the founding period of the EU. It is of that order. It is truly transformational. So I leave it at that and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Brigitte. Um, I don't know if the participants have already questions. They can take uh, a few minutes to, to, to think about it and, and post them in a the chat or just raise their hands. Um, I was wondering, because I've been working on these issues as well with my colleague Stella Ladi, and as you said, we need to understand how the member states can buy in into the collective and, and uh, do you think that um, the pandemic has not shown that uh, it's the we could we could rethink the concept of Europeanization uh, in terms of coordinative co Europeanization that we have seen way more coordination between member states and the EU level and it's not either or it's really together that's that that was something that came across our analysis would would you share that? So I am increasingly, and maybe it's because I've worked on the EU for such a long time, I'm very tired of the academic debate about the EU as is it intergovernmental or supranational? It is both and. And what matters is how the collective, the whole and the parts work. And that what you described in terms of the coordination is one important mode of governance that we see. But there are also others. Uh, for example, during Brexit, it was Brexit was chef's act. It was the heads of government that were in the control room. But in the determination of the framing of Brexit and of the way in which the EU managed its, the relationships between Brussels and the capitals, between the Commission and the member states. It was driven by the council working party, which was chaired by a council official, not by a member state official. And of course, you had the Commission task force as well. So the collective capacity was created at EU level and then the task was to make sure that the flows of engagement and information, but also policy making, were very transparent and very open between the capitals and Brussels. And so what, what I see is an EU that has become more collective when it can, when it can use... Um, when it can use the, when it can get the member states collectively moving in the same direction. Yeah, absolutely. But it, it really does depend on a style of governance that's transparent, that's permanent, it's permanent deliberation and discussion. Mm -hmm. Or if you look at the RRF and the negotiations, and I'm writing a paper on that now, the, the liberal intergovernmental view of EU negotiations where preference formation starts at the domestic and are brought to Brussels, in my view, doesn't come close to giving us the analytical purchase on a system whereby the heads of government met by, La Ruta met with, had 10 meetings before the July meeting. 
uh, Conway had 10 meetings before the July meeting. Merkel had eight. So this constant high level engagement. Now, uh, Uwe Putter et al. call this the new intergovernmentalism. And that again gives you some analytical purchase, but in my view does not get at the collective enough. Yeah, that's an excellent uh, point. Um, I see we had um, Nemonja who has raised uh, yeah, a hand you. and then I, I will take Agat. So two questions and, I, and then we'll have the two questions in the chat. And if you can introduce yourself, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Hello, my name is Nemanja, I'm coming from Serbia and I'm a PhD student and teaching assistant at the Faculty of Political Sciences, University of Belgrade. And I'm engaged on uh, yeah, Department for International Organizations and European Integration, mostly on EU enlargement policy because we are from Serbia, very interesting in that field, of course. So I would like to uh, say my observation about one, one term that you mentioned, it's um, uh, disintegration, because I have a problem with that term, because um, there is two kinds of integration, actually. You have a horizontal one and vertical one, and um, it is a problem considering the Brexit and impact on European disintegration, how we can measure that, because European Union in, in a field of horizontal integration is, of course, smaller now, and we can call this a reverse enlargement because it showed us that European Union is now smaller. So there is um, something that we can measure. But when we talk about deeper integration, we all know that Euro uh, United Kingdom is always, always was, or most time was um, Eurosceptic country and um, in that term, but very pro um, enlargement because for the United Kingdom, Bigger European Union means weaker European Union. So it's a good for um, Euroscepticism. But we can't measure the impact of Brexit so easily because we have European Union now for years now, I, I, I would say for a decade now, in a multi-level crisis. So it is very um, difficult to, um, to isolate only the impact of Brexit. Because, for example, European Union now is in COVID crisis. So we now can't say, is it um, Brexit in the first year good or bad for European Union? Because we constantly have new and new crises in European Union. And that's a huge problem for measuring the Brexit impact. So I'm very um, uh, skeptic about that, that, that term, disintegration actually impact of Brexit to European disintegration. I, I think it's, a, it's a too soon to, to measure something like that. Maybe in 10 years it would be easier, but now it's very difficult. Uh, thank, uh, thank you and thank you very much for, for your observation and question. So I think there is now a literature on disintegration. There are those who argue that uh, scholars of integration have not been attentive enough to disintegrative forces. Mm -hmm. And that I think is very valid. And therefore one has to take seriously that literature. When I look at disintegration and I look at the concept first and then, then talk about Brexit. So I would say there's a distinction between what I call systemic disintegration, which is the danger of the polity and the single market collapse. So that's systemic. In other, and remember, and of course, coming from Serbia, former Yugoslavia, I don't need to tell you political systems can and yeah. do collapse. Yeah, so course. systemic disintegration. But then I would distinguish between policy disintegration and space. And I regard Brexit not as systemic disintegration, it will not have that impact on the EU. I would regard it as disintegration in terms of space. In other words, formally, a member state has left. And that's all I would say. As to the long-term impact of Brexit on the EU, I think we ca actually can judge. So we can now say that the EU can weather the departure 
of a state like the United Kingdom, a partly in, partly out state. In other words, the United Kingdom is not an indispensable member state of the EU. But if Germany decided to leave the EU in the morning, then I would say that moves you directly into systemic disintegration. So I think it's important to look at the states that are absolutely indispensable for system survival versus the others. And I also think that it's important to think about the differences between internal differentiation in the EU and external differentiation. So these are the kinds of categories I would use. I think they I think it's important to be clear as to the the concept of the the conceptualization of the core concept and therefore what that allows you to say and what it allows you to 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 look at. But I I would reach a very hard conclusion already after five years since the referendum that the United Kingdom is not an indispensable member state of the EU. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Thank you very much, I get. Yes, thank you very much for this for this um, talk. Um, I, I just have a quick uh, question. You mentioned at the end of your presentation the, the this topic about uh, EU's legitimacy, and I just wanted to have your views about what kind of legitimacy is the most pressing according to you. Is it uh, input? Is it output? Or is it uh, throughput? What what is really um, at stake uh, according to you? So. Uh, I think that the EU has a very high level of formal legitimacy. It, everything it does is based on almost everything, <laughs> rule of law, legal treaties, the permission of the, the permission and consent of the member states. So that gives a very high level of formal legitimacy. I think social legitimacy, is different because social legitimacy is what comes from a sense that the way in which one is governed is legitimate and there is a level of identification. So firstly, on the three categories you used, performance legitimacy has always been important to the EU and always will be. Throughput legitimacy, how it does its business, in my view, is very important to the EU and will continue to be. And the where we're where the the the, the struggle is is that juxtaposition in the EU between its dual, dual nature. It is a union of states, but also of peoples. And it is the it is the how to orchestrate a union of peoples at a scale that is continental because we also scholars we carry mental maps of political systems in our heads and so the mental map we have of the EU is the nation state it can't ever be it's not and never will be a scaled up uh, form of the nation state as a form of political order it will always be distinctive so the question is always, and this is because democracy is always in flux and in transition, does it have enough? That's the question. How seriously would it be tested? And when we look at the evidence in public opinion now, I would say that there, there are three if, and this now is a gross generalization. So <laughs> there, I would say there are three groups. There is a group that is largely indifferent, but not opposed to European integration. And when it's drawn to their attention and they feel it's necessary for policy goals, they're fine with it. That's the kind of output stuff. Then there is a group that 
oppose the creation of a form of political order above the state. And that's the sort of Eurosceptics to hard Eurosceptics, who, and the hard Eurosceptics, would wish that the system disintegrated. But I think one of the interesting phenomenon, and this is a Brexit-related phenomenon, is that in the United Kingdom, it unleashed a significant cohort of the electorate that became emotionally European because they were losing it. Those big marches that sense the use of the European flag, that's very identity and emotional. And interestingly, I think it also created across the EU a sense of we don't want to go there. Now, and if you think of the late, the last Dutch election, you had on the one hand the Eurosceptics, but you also had more pro-European. So I think there's conflict about the system, as there should be. It's why would we expect the creation of the EU to be conflict-free? And why would we expect the creation of a new polity not to have struggle? and contestation and conflict. And if we read Stein Roken, we should remember that cleavages matter. Thank you very much for this very comprehensive uh, answer. Yeah, and we have more questions in the chat. Uh, Angelica, I think your, your connection is unstable, so I will ask it on your behalf. You would like to have some thoughts from Brigitte on the conference on the future of Europe. And do you think it is a good way to reply to the increasing EU politicization? I think that's a great question. All, all your questions are great. Uh, we really don't know where the conference on Europe is going. Uh, I always worry when the future of Europe is down to something called a conference, because I look at great power competition. And I think maybe how the American Chinese relationship develops may have much more impact on Europe's future than the conference on the future of Europe. I think it's an interesting exercise in deliberative democracy. And it also may have a significant pedagogical effect in terms of that transformative agenda, climate, digital, because I think across Europe, we need to understand that the challenges are fundamental and the mobilization and capacity required to deal with them is very significant. Whether it ends up in a new treaty and whatever, I'm less, you know, I know that that if I'm in the European Parliament and I'm an MEP or I'm on the Constitutional Committee of the Parliament, then treaty change is the holy grail. Uh, whereas for me, I'm more interested in the nature of the deliberation, the quality of de deliberation, and what I see as a very slow, messy, evolution towards more transnationalism. So I think the conference on the future of Europe, I think holding it in pandemic times is, I'm not sure it's wise, but it's happening. Uh, and so for me, how it's done matters almost as much as what it ends up doing. I think it's an opportunity to bring to, to get more public debate on what is what it is to live with a high level of deep interdependence. Thank you uh, very much. Um, we have Debbie. Would you like to ask your question in person, or I'm not sure if you have trouble with your connection. You're here, Deborah. about member states agreement. Yes, um, Professor Laughlin, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, in terms of the continuing direction, we've moved from the 1950s and 60s from, a year, from an economic union of increasing 
expansion to an increasingly political union, including things like security, et cetera. And are we now seeing a move to what I would call a more social union where on a transnational basis, they'll, they will start to uh, move into people's lives more and more uh, within the EU. And my question is, are all the member states, do you think, happy to move in this direction of travel? So, uh, great question. Uh, where is the EU at? So, I'm not sure that I would classify the EU as moving from the economic to the political. Because again, if you interrogate Brexit very carefully, it was striking the extent to which the member states rediscovered the customs union and the single market. And they really understood that this was a strategic asset. So I don't think that there has been, rather that the process of integration itself has become more politicized and more contested. And that's because of more opposition, but it's also because the EU is now engaging in areas that are core state powers, money, foreign affairs, PESCO in terms of defense. So in my view, that move was inevitable, the politicization. And Joe Nye in his wonderful piece in parts 1970 or 72, it's so long ago now I've forgotten, uh, in, he predicted that there would be politicization. He just wasn't sure if the, he said that the test of politicization would be, could the EU bear the burden of politicization? And that's where we're, that's where we are now. And the evidence suggests for now it can, but I'm not saying forever and always. Now on the social, I think that the Gothenburg summit, the social charter, I think you will see increasingly in Europe the EU as being the, 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 the establishing the base rights. So you can't overcome the fact that the EU has member states who are much richer than others. <clears throat> because again, one of the underestimated elements of the dynamic of integration has been the openness of the EU to poorer countries. It actually was never a rich man's club. It has progressively opened to countries that are much poorer than the core. So you can't, in a sense, if you have a minimum wage, it can't be the same across Europe, a basic income, it can't be the same. But what you can do is try to make sure that there is a, 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 a floor on what that should be. And so I think, yes, you will see more social Europe. And it will be not just about those who move, because obviously free movement has generated rights for the movers, but it also needs to pay attention to those who don't move to the settle. I think it's much more likely to come via uh, floors in terms of rights. But then, of course, we saw with the with Orban and the Hungarian government very recently, the LTGB rights. Again, that seems to have had a galvanizing effect on the other heads of government. There has never in the history of European integration been a European Council where, apart from support from Slovenia and Poland, a head of government was rounded on. He was rounded on. And it was seen an absolute affront to the values that Europe represents. So I think that that cleavage is there. But in a way, for me, what happened at that European Council tells me that it's three versus the rest. So in other words, it's not a cleavage that goes right through the EU. Rather, it is the conservative authoritarians and only Slovenia and Poland supported Orban at that meeting. And he got a roasting. Now, he deserved it. And I'm, and I'm also pleased that the heads of government uh, decided politeness was not required. Because, again, one of the, the EU also has a strong diplomatic element. And politeness towards each other is the reflex. But there was no politeness in the room that night. And I have heard, I've had a, 
I, I've had a confidential briefing of that European Council and it was, I would have loved to have been a fly at the wall because it was truly historic and very important. But if, if and again, LGTB might be, but let, if there was an issue that came to be so fundamental to effectively being in the club of Europe, would the others turn around and say to that member state, go? I mean, so <laughs> I, the, the unfortunate thing about the EU treaties is exit is a choice a, of a member state. Exactly. There's no there's no mechanism, as far as I know, to, to no. actually throw somebody out. No. And in fact, I can think of one or two who might benefit, or at least the <laughs> EU might benefit from being able. But on the other hand, and this is again the, the, the historic point, I think that we, it was naive in 1989 to imagine that countries that had been in single party government, very totalitarian systems, that there would be a very smooth, inexorable, establishment of stable democracies. So if this is episodic, it's not a problem. It's simply politics and history. But if it's a permanent feature of some governments, then I think it's a, a bigger problem for the EU. But the fact that it's happening again shouldn't surprise us. But again, if you think back to 89, there was this wonderful optimism and even, you know, that end of history. Wow. <laughs> mm. So but was, I, that, I, was, was that over optimistic? Of and course. I mean, you know, when you draft a document, you always have an exit plan, you know, have a way of getting out of it. And it seems with the treaty for, you know, the, the European Union, they never gave themselves an exit plan. Because in a way you can't, because you really want to create a political system, a polity, and so you don't you don't start with exit. When but you're even creating. the American Constitution gives you an exit plan, as we found in 1865, if not, you know. <laughs> and I mean, there have been there has been moves to various American states, including Texas, bless it, to uh, secede from the Union again. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, how that worked I, out though. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I, we'll just I, cut their electricity off, Robert. <laughs> I, Can I just I add one? Sorry, sorry. So sorry, we had someone who had the uh, uh, Xiong. You you also had your raised your hand. Would you, so, would you like to go, Jilson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then you. and then Nemanja. Sorry. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating discussion. Uh, I'm. Gilson, I'm a PhD student at Sussex, University of Sussex. And uh, so there uh, have been, I mean, the European Union has been taking uh, more integrated steps during this uh, pandemic crisis. And also there has been this strong, how should I say, cooperative tone among uh, EU member states. So uh, in this regard, I wanted to ask you, how do you think national youth skeptic parties would respond to this kind of, how should I say, uh, change or yeah, or the increase of the uh, the EU's uh, uh, use uh, budgetary cap capacity? I mean, fiscal capacity. So, for the moment, uh, the RRF and the is temporary and but it has created a precedent and temporary can last a very long time mm -hmm. so either the rrf is uh, either it's temporary one off and will never be repeated or mm -hmm. the precedent has been established and because it's a, it's the equi functional equivalent of a European safe asset. The markets love it. When the EU will go out to, to, to borrow collectively, there will be a demand for that in the financial markets. So I can see circumstances in which it becomes a virtuous cycle. And of course, the EU can't withdraw liquidity either from the financial markets very quickly or easily. So I think we're in a very interesting phase when there is a, the RRF 
is a step change, but the legacy it will leave is to still to be determined. And if it if it seemed to be a success, if the country I'm now living in, Italy, if Italy makes good use of the RRF, then that will really matter. Mm. If it doesn't, then Mark Rutte or his successor, if there ever is a successor in as a Dutch prime minister, will simply put up his hands and say, "Ah, uh-uh, we told you so. So I think the politics of the implementation of the RRF will be fascinating. And I, I, um, I wrote a book in 1997 on the finances of the union. And because the, the kind of scholar I am, I like doing something once. I don't I'm not someone who likes to do second or third editions of anything because I enjoy the challenge time one, but not time two. But for the first time since 97, I think a book on the finances of the EU should be written. I'm not going to do it, but it should be written. The finances have become really interesting again. And if we think of climate change, climate change is going to require public power, and public budgets. So we're in a very interesting time too, in terms of that public-private divide. Uh, And so for all those reasons, I would pay, for any of you working on EU finances as part of your dissertation, I think you're working at a very good time. Thank you. Uh, we have one last uh, question, I think, from Nemanja. And, and in addition, because uh, we have all this team of doctoral students, I would like also to take, you know, t- to reflect a little bit on what are, you, you mentioned financial services or area is, is good to research. What would be your, uh, your three main tips for our young doctoral students in terms of researching EU-UK relations? But first, Nemanja, you have the floor. Thank you. I would like. I would just like to say something about uh, a previous conversation with Deborah, because she was constantly as- asking why we don't have exit clause for such kind of countries like Central and Eastern Europe. Europe. Well, uh, the uh, before two thousand and nine, actually two thousand and four, uh, and the Constitution Treaty, uh, which, which is never uh, came on on power. Um, we, we didn't have withdraw a clause also, and it was a huge legal question, can you withdraw by yourself from the European Union? And that's, that kind of institutional solution actually is a tool to, to motivate country to be, countries to become a part of something like European Union, because European uh, community, and after that European Union was um, a really, really um, um, new project, how to say, and it was um, it was not a good idea to, 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 to have something like that close, how to, to disqualify country or something like that. So it's a motivation tool, actually. So it's something um, that is well known from the um, international organizations also, because the first international organization was, was has Close, but second one, United Nations does not have the double close. So it's an actually tool of the founding fathers to motivate countries. So I think uh, that's the reason why you can't expel any country because it's not good um, motivation for them to, to become something part of the European Union. And, and we can revise from uh, Hishman, uh, loyalty yes. voice and exit, as well as Absolutely. on these issues next to the legal uh, discussion. Big, Brigitte, we need to come to a conclusion. Uh, so maybe if you would like to give some tips to our doctoral students. What would well, you- for, firstly, can I just wish you all uh, ve- the very best as you complete your doctorate. Uh, the, the only thing you need to finish a doctorate, in my view, in the end, is stamina, because by that stage, you'll be tired of your subject, <laughs> but, but stick with it and you'll get there. Uh, and of course, always in a doctorate, there's a time when you're swimming underwater, but you will come up. So just keep, keep at it. But in terms of subjects on Brexit and the EU, so I, for me, I would... I think that there is 
a lot of work to be done, interestingly, on the impact of Brexit on the United Kingdom itself. I think it has had a major impact on territorial politics within the UK, and that is historic. That as that plays its way through in relation to Scotland and Northern Ireland, but also England uh, is very interesting. I think time and only time will allow us to uh, analyze whether or not the EU had sufficient innovation in its, in its governance approach to deal with a large state on its border that is a competitor as well as a partner uh, and how that works out. I think the, the whole level playing field is very interesting legally, but also in terms of governance. And then finally, the overall relationship itself, in my view, is neither stable nor at a good equilibrium. And so how the EU model of sharing sovereignty can achieve a modus vivendi with the UK model of absolute sovereignty, there is a clash of models and sovereignty practices here. And how that, uh, how the EU manages this will also be a test of its neighborhood policy, but it's not pretty at the moment. It's not, this is not a healthy, stable equilibrium between partners that share so much in common. And I think that that's a, an excellent point we've been discussing during this week as well, how the EU is increasingly dealing with troublemakers, you know, and in its neighborhood and uh, on states which are not looking up towards the EU, but actually want to be more in competition or where there is a lack of trust, especially yeah. for, for the UK. So this is, and, and I'm also curious to hear if Brussels is thinking about this and how to remodel the neighborhood policy <laughs> with it, these issues. And so I, I think that one shouldn't underestimate the extent to which the EU now is willing to use power. Mm. The EU, you know, normative power Europe, we're nice people. We wish the world would be like us. Well, the EU has understood the world is not like the EU. Mm. And uh, I'm very struck by what, what I see as that increasing... I hesitate to use the word state because whenever I use the word state in relation to the EU, it's misunderstood. But stateness. That's that's uh, an excellent conclusion. I think it's it has given us a lot of food for thought. It's an excellent conclusion to our uh, series of talks um, with keynote speakers. And we wish you a very nice summer an excellent retirement but we hope to see you again at the next <laughs> uk we hope you come and talk to us because you have this global vision of, of of europe integration which is really fascinating so thank you uh, to you and to the participants and for the participants we we're now moving to the other zoom meeting thank you so much bye, -bye. bye, -bye. thank you very enjoy much enjoy the rest of your time thank you and good luck to all of you yeah <laughs>